Welcome, Izumi Nation, to the first of the viewer participation event videos. This is Maho Shoujo Izumi Chan, and there's probably an adorable graphic of me cross dressing up on your screen right now. Um, well, with me and doing the interview for this particular episode is none other than Jillian from GS Force Cosplay. Hi, everyone! Jillian is awesome, and she's here <laughs> to talk to me about Princess Tutu. Yes, because it's also festive. It is festive. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a great word. I think it's I think it's festive. <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> all right. Was, are you ready? For, are you ready for all of these questions? I, I think I'm as prepared as I can be. I just finished the series as of when we were recording. I finished the series about a week before. So. Excellent. I myself have been preparing questions and been on rewatching the series. So. Awesome. All ready for this. Ugh. All right. Well, I'm going to start off with question one. Princess Tutu is defined as a ballet-themed magical girl anime. What similarities and differences do you find between Tutu and other magical girl anime? Okay. Um, I love that that's where we're starting at, because that was one of the first things that stuck out to me in the way that the things are set up. Mm -hmm. And I'm hesitant to call it staging, but that's what it felt like, was mm -hmm. all of the... Um, the climax of every episode is staged like a, a play, like a ballet play or like a, a ballet show, I guess would be the better recital. That's the word I'm looking for. I thought that was something that made it different, but made it also just amazing. There was this, uh, there was definitely this really artsy approach to it. I thought that was cool. I mean, you have the traditional magical girl things are there. Uh, Duck has her transformation sequence. Um, which is the same animation every episode that the animators clearly put a lot of time and effort into so it doesn't look terrible. Um, but you, you have that. You have, um, um, you have uh, Duck has uh, her powers definitely flow from uh, her more um, feminine uh, characteristics. And I loved the fact that, um, and I, I, I talk about this sometimes, that I think there's something more pure in the Magical Girl series where... Um, where the main character solves things, like when they, through some skill or something that really sets them apart that isn't necessarily violence. I love in Sailor Moon that every time it's like, love and justice, I'm going to actually incinerate you. <laughs> and like comparatively, you look at characters like Duck or Sakura, like Duck's way of dealing with almost any conflict is this invitation to dance. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was... I, that that is again. That's magical girl at its purest. It's armored in the traditionally feminine, mm -hmm. uh, but there is great strength in it. Um, Duck is definitely the strongest character in the story, despite the fact that she's not physically, you know, a strong fighter. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of characters who are fighters. Um, Fakir obviously um, is a fighter in the story. We have uh, uh, Muto eventually becomes a fighter, but the real strength in the series comes from Duck. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think. I think that those magical girl roots are what make Duck such a strong character, but I think the ballet motif and the and almost the storybook motif set it apart and make it a stronger, more unique series. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoy that Duck's transformation is, like, only, like, 20 seconds instead of, like, Thank God. three minutes every <laughs> single episode. Every time she transforms, it's, like, five seconds. Okay, we're done. We get it. She transformed. On to the next thing. <laughs> yeah, we don't, need, we don't need to see every part of her costume, like, get put on or to materialize <laughs> from somewhere and to rock out to the Japanese butt rock. Although... Right? <laughs> Not gonna lie, that is that is one of the highlights of 90s Sailor Moon, is the Japanese butt rock. Just saying. <laughs> Alright, well, let's move on to the next question. One of the highlights of the show, in my opinion anyway, is the character of Drosselmeyer, who, for those who don't know, wrote the story that the characters are in. How do you interpret Drosselmeyer's portrayal in the show, and what role do you find he ultimately plays? Drosselmeyer was such an interesting thing. No, no, like, I'm, I'm right there with you. It What's fascinating about Drosselmeyer is he's almost a meta-commentary of the writers on themselves and writers in general. Drosselmeyer, the joy that he derives from the other characters is almost completely from tormenting them. Mm -hmm. Like, in he is... He reminds me of my own 
habits as a writer and probably maybe every artist, all artists, um, have this is like you create something or you create a character, especially when you're telling a story, writing a story, performing a play, a movie, any of that sort of thing. You're creating these characters and you want to make them as real as possible, but often to make it interesting, you put conflict into the story. What was interesting about how they decided to portray Drosselmeyer is just how cruel that really is when you think about it. Because oh, yes. even if they're not real people, it's a concept. Like, you're trying to make it, you as a writer are trying to make this as real as possible. And now to do the thing you want to do, you have to torment that creation. And that is his entire function. He he revels in finding ways to torment the characters, and I appreciated that the characters themselves get the chance to rebel against that, but at the same time, have they really rebelled so much? Mm -hmm. I like. I think there's also a meta-commentary in there about what's wrong with happy endings. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Uh, I know Madoka Magica is on the docket for things I'm eventually talking about, and I've been told that that's incredibly depressing and it seems like in especially modern geekdom we find i find anyway that people are more willing to take something seriously it's dark it's serious you know it's it's for adults because it's sad and gloomy and batman cannot be for children anymore that that, that sort of thing and it seemed like at the end of the day with fakir and duck what they do in the final chapters of the story it's that rebellion of characters mm -hmm. saying, what's wrong with happy endings? Mm -hmm. Like, it, yes, the storyteller is going to put their characters through a lot. They're going to torment them, hurt them. But maybe letting them, throwing them a bone once in a while wouldn't mm -hmm. hurt. I thought he was interesting. I really was glad he was part of whatever this was. Um, his thing in the background, his function... His function within the story while existing outside the story. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he was so it was so interesting between him and his relationship with Miss Adel mm -hmm. and how he had planted her there to kind of guide Duck on this journey as well, and then she eventually ended up not following Drosomala's plan and then but I what I uh, I guess I the thing that really stuck out too is just how cute and innocent the series starts out as. Right. And I love that <laughs> I love that it's it goes into a dark place, mm -hmm. but going into a dark place doesn't necessarily mean you have to have graphically everyone dying and blood mm -hmm. everywhere. Going into a dark place can be exploring darker parts of the psyche. It can mm -hmm. be showing people just coping with loss. Or mm -hmm. This is a very mature show that dresses itself up as something that I th as something not quite as... It dresses itself up as something harmless, mm -hmm. but it really is about something important. Mm -hmm. And I think those are important for any age group to have, but especially children. Because I feel like children's media talks down to kids too much. And Oh, by far, yeah. Yeah, and this... I could see a younger viewer watching this and deriving a lot of enjoyment from it. And it may be the best kind of enjoyment because it's one of those things that I think someone younger could watch it and derive a lot of enjoyment from it, but then come back to it as an adult and appreciate it even more. I know I found through like several uh, rewatchings of the series, I felt I got like more and more from it. And you know, I started watching it this year and I'm 25. So even being older, I kept watching it and just kept drawing more from it, which I think is great for a series. Mm. All right. Uh, next question. So each episode is loosely based off of a classic ballet, and the show uses the music from each ballet it centers on. How do you find that the classical music enriches the story? Um, the main point there that I have with the classical music enriching the story, Ghost is much more mean-spirited than anything else I'm going to say. <laughs> Because the soundtrack was done by Kaoru Wada. Mm -hmm. Kaoru Wada is an awful composer, and I don't know why. I think it's a he, maybe it's a she. I don't know why they still have a job. Because every Kaoru Wada soundtrack sounds exactly the same to me. Mm -hmm. um, Samurai 7, uh, Inuyasha, a bunch, all of these are Kaoru Wada. And you, it's almost Kaoru Wada soundtrack bingo. If it doesn't have a song that goes... Bum, 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 
Bam, 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 bam. I don't know that it's Kauruata. Like, that is his one trick. And the fact that it it fell back on this actually great music enriched the... Because as soon as I saw Kauruata, I'm like, crap. <laughs> like, I'm looking at the credits like, no, 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 no. Um, I don't really know ballet super well. I mean, I don't really know the medium that well. But I really... I did enjoy... I, I think I enjoyed more... It did help with the whole, what I mentioned before, the staging thing. Mm -hmm. That it looks like something that's staged. That it's yep. being done on a on a theater. Even especially in the the mid-series climax and then the end-series climax. Yeah, with, because uses Swan Lake from Tchaikovsky. Well, even uh, the Crow People. Yep. Like, the, they, it's... Aside from uh, Muto near the end, most of the Crow People literally look like people in Crow costumes. Mm -hmm. It's It's so staged, and... It's in, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Is I like you could see this being performed by people. Yeah, <laughs> there's something a Princess Tutu actual ballet. I would pay to see that. <laughs> I would I would pay to see that too. It's it's better than the fact that I it, I'm sad that doesn't exist and a Bleach musical does. Right. Yeah. Let's. Are let, there like four Bleach musicals? There are. I've seen Dark Side of the Moon. Wait. Yeah. I've seen one of them. You're I've seen one of them. I regret my decision for it. And I actually own it, so uh, we're not going there. I started a... For what it's worth, uh, I started a Facebook group about it. It's called There's a Freakin' Bleach Musical. I think it still exists. But it was weird because I started that group to make fun of it. And then the actual fans of the Bleach Musical came in. Oh, no. So everyone who is part of that group, you don't get it. <laughs> no, but I love you anyway. Except maybe one of you. <laughs> maybe. Kind oh, of. man. <laughs> All right. Um, our next question. Fate and free will are two of the most common themes throughout this series. What elements of the story do you find drawn out? Fuck here. Mm -hmm. If I can, I, I mean, I'm just going to lay him out there. Oh, um, yeah, for as, sure. Fakir is this character that I went into the series not wanting to like. And the series doesn't right? want... This series is great at misdirection. Oh, gosh, Because yes. it keeps throwing things at you. It's like, yeah, Crahey, don't you hate her? Ah, now you feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's the same with, with Fakir. Like, for a couple episodes, I was replacing that A with a U. Um, like, he's <laughs> such an un... Pleasant character, but you when you find out what the cause of his unpleasantness, oh, yeah. um, that that he really just he cares about Muto, he cares about the prince and the story, he just cares about the story so much, and he doesn't want the terrible things in it to happen, that he's become hardened by that, and his. What's great about Fuck here is that he never accepts what fate has dealt him. Not, not even once. Even when he comes close to, when he actually dons the the costume of the knight, mm -hmm. he still doesn't accept what his fate is supposed to be. He actually, he literally shatters the instrument of his demise just to make sure that his fate is not written. Uh, and he does that for a lot of other characters. Um, he also brings out the questions like, is being what you really are bad? You know, like, I really thought that was interesting that that's, like, his final thing for Duck is, yeah. hey, is, like, I know you want to be the prima ballerina superhero, but what you really, do you need to deny who you really are to find that? Mm -hmm. Um, Just fuck here in general was, is the just the best character for everything about Defying Fate. Duck to her own degree, too, because she's, um, as I mentioned before, she is the strongest character, and in many ways, she is the one pushing Duck and Fakir's relationship. Uh, holy crap. I could not handle it at some points. I just burst into tears. <laughs> they, their support for each other near the end of the series mm -hmm. is so beautiful. There is... There is when Duck starts to falter, it's Fakir who is there to pick, to kind of pick her up and get her back on track. But it's it's both ways. When Fakir starts to falter, Duck is there for him. 
-hmm. it's a give and take relationship. It's it's one of the least overtly romantic relationships I've seen in an anime where their romance is written better than what than most overtly <laughs> romantic relationships are in anime. It drives me nuts how terrible couples act mm -hmm. in these shows. But then you have Duck and Fuck here who are they really are each other's rocks, mm -hmm. holding each other up against this continuing continually ebbing tide of fate and they hold and because of that, through each other, they 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 push it back. They actually pull through, and I loved that uh, Adel early in the series. What she says: um, uh, "Happiness to those who accept their fate, but glory to those who defy it." Mm -hmm. And that comes to play at the very like in several moments, but especially at the mid series climax, and then at the yeah. the big finale when Duck still dances her heart out, even when she's just a little duck. Yeah, those were two highlights uh, for the between the relationship and Duck and Fakir is when uh, Duck can't get her pendant off because she doesn't want the story to end and Fakir, you know, says, mm -hmm. you know, is it really so bad to be a duck? And, you know, at the end when she's fighting for hope for Muto and Fakir draws from Duck's strength and you're right, the relationship between the two is just, oh, so heartwarming. They were amazing characters. Um, I, I really adored both of them. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I... I'll let you go on to your next question. I'm trying to figure out how to discuss Krahe and Muto because they they well, deserve. Well, you know bit what? We might as well just let's just talk about that. What, what did you feel about the relationship between Muto and Krahe, or Muto and Rue? Again, so complicated with the misleads. <laughs> Rue is such an. She is so again at the beginning of the series. She's so mean, I know. selfish. <laughs> But then, it's, but then again, you get these reveals. It's like, okay, so she thinks she's a crow's daughter or a raven's daughter mm -hmm. who's a crow, but she's not a crow. Even, and you you actually get little hints that everything that's happening to her is against her will. She doesn't, when she's Rue, she doesn't remember being Krahe. Mm -hmm. When you see her transform into Krahe, it's not this the beautiful thing like what you see with uh, Duck into Tutu. Mm -hmm. It's it, it, her... Uh, ballet shoes almost, uh, I don't, the, it, violate is the wrong word because it has too much of a strong connotation mm -hmm. with it, but it, it's invading her space. It's yes. taking her away from herself. <laughs> um, I, Muto is such a hard character to read too because he is an incomplete person yep. for the first part of the story. It, it's like uh, the early parts of Tsubasa when Sakura is such a blank slate that you don't even have anything to work with for her. Mm -hmm. So it's not until later in the story that you get a feel for what she is about. And the same with Muto. I didn't really quite catch what his deal was. And when he becomes complete, um, Muto is, I guess, going back to your last question, is very much, I'd say he is the one who's most tied to fate. Yep. He does not fight... I think Muto is actually probably the weakest character mm -hmm. in so many ways. That. Yeah, mm -hmm. he has nothing. He's constantly being rescued. He is defended by people. And what's kind of awful is that I really don't think he does much to... The only character who he ever reciprocates anything toward is Rue slash Krahe. Yeah. Like, everyone else is really giving their all for him, and he never seems to be thankful yeah. or even... Even at the end, facing the raven, it's Duck who comes to his rescue to give the pendant, and then he's able to go save yeah, Rue. Then he's able to go save Rue, but yeah, he is so he is a slave to the story in every yeah. way, and he never overcomes that. I and yeah, he, Muto never overcomes anything. He's just that is his his function. Mm -hmm. He fills it well, um, and I guess like the the best thing you can say for him is that he is able to pull Krahe, mm -hmm. Krahe Rue out of the terrible place that she's in. Yep. And so, I mean, I'm not going to say he's a terrible person, mm -hmm. but he's so weak compared to everyone else. And I'm including Krahe. Yep. Because, I mean, Rue goes through so much bullcrap. Mm -hmm. for, and the, the Raven is such a terrifying parent figure. Yep. This, again, that's a, the Raven's not a good example of it looking like a stage show. It's not, yeah. he's not even a physical force. He looks like a lighting effect. Yep. And, and I mean that in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. it, it almost makes him more imposing because he's not, he's more of a concept than anything else. Oh, yeah. 
And it, so, yeah, those, um, I, it was just interesting seeing where the, the Krahe thing was just so many great misdirects, though, because you expect yeah, yeah. her to be, even just her first appearance, it's like, oh, so that's the raven. Yeah. So Krahe is the raven. Okay, that makes sense. So good, good bird, bad bird. I get it. <laughs> it's, it's like, oh. Oh no, she's just a poor person who, who terrible things that happen. Who stole childbirth and oh. it was it put raven blood in her just for the raven's own doing. You're like, uh, oh. 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 Yeah, there's some really uncomfortable connotations. Ew. Ew. Um, maybe that was the right word choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. No, I really felt for her in the end. And I think that. I think she. Bringing her full circle was good. The fact that she got a happy ending. I'm fine with, yep. but it just, it was kind of there. It was, mm -hmm. it was there because this is, this is a story, this is a fairy tale, and fairy tales have to end this way, was how it yeah. felt for me. I, I didn't feel nearly as strongly about that as seeing, as how Duck and Fakir interact, and yep. seeing even when she's still a duck, that Fakir is still there mm -hmm. with her. But speaking of the ending, I think a lot of people were surprised that in the end, it's not Duck who gets the guy at the end, it is Rue... Who gets, you know, Muto chooses Rue. And I'm good with that. So am I. I, partly because, yeah, Muto is such a weak character and he and Duck never really have any meaningful chemistry. Mm -hmm. I mean, even his fixation on Tutu is really just the whole, it's, again, Muto's just part of the story. That's mm -hmm. Tutu's thing. She defends him, she helps him, yep. and she makes him complete for the final battle. Mm -hmm. But the chemistry, I don't think it would have, I don't think the way that the characters developed that it would have made any sense yep. on one level. And then on a, I think on a, um, I guess a more complete level, it's just who, I don't necessarily think it's even that good a message that in order to, for girls or even guys watching, I don't think it's a good message that you know you won because you got the significant other in the yeah. end. I. I think that it's a much stronger and more meaningful message to have Duck go through a, a meaningful character yeah. experience to grow as a person, and so and maybe that growth is enough reward. Yep. Oh, I totally agree with that. Um, all right, on to our next question. Um, this is kind of more general, not specifically um, about any anybody, but what was your first impression about the show once you had finished it, or maybe while you were watching it and has that impression changed at all now you've had time to reflect upon it? I I was... The fact that the show had an epilogue mm -hmm. was... It was weird for me because I'm so used to series pushing everything to the last minute and then that's just kind of, well, that's where we're ending. <laughs> and the fact that it had that epilogue was really weird because I'm... because just seeing everything so peaceful. Mm -hmm. I was... And that the show let me get my energy back down was welcome, but at the same time, I was like, wow, I, I kind of can't believe that's over. I, I, I actually kind of hurt that it was over. Mm -hmm. I was sad. It was like, well, that's that's it. That's, um... And reflecting on it now, I do. I think that that was the best way to go about it, though, mm -hmm. because that's the other... Because it's one of the central themes is that defiance of fate, oh. I don't think it would have made sense to close it out like a regular story, to just have happy ending, the end. I think the message that life goes on, and that Fakir and Duck and everyone else are going to push forward, I think that that's almost more powerful, that life is going to continue. The little shots we saw of the other characters were heartbreaking, though. Like, seeing like the, the more magical characters turn back into, you know, regular animals, mm -hmm. seeing the Seeing Duck's two terrible friends try to figure out what it is that they're missing. And of course they wouldn't know what they're missing because both of her friends are awful people. <laughs> I, I, almost, I almost missed my segue into PK and Lillier. I hate them both. I'm sad that they lived. Every time they opened their mouths, I, was, I would scream at the television... Like, and if Raina was on this, she would, she would testify. I would scream at the television, you have the worst friends. <laughs> Your friends suck. <laughs> They're awful. They're awful, awful people. 
They, they their entire function in the story for the in the off chance that you haven't watched this series, why are you listening to it? No, but um, <laughs> but if 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 this discussion has made you want to see it, PK and Lily are, are Duck's two friends from ballet class who are constantly condescending and being mean to her. Um, Lily actually delights in the fact that Duck is a klutz who can't do anything right, and takes joy in every time she fails. She's awful. <laughs> So I didn't, I felt bad to see them alive. No. Um, but it was kind of sad, like, to see Mr. Cat as a regular cat. And all these other characters who I got to know as people are now just animals again. But again, maybe it's, maybe fuck here's right. You know, it's uh, what's wrong with being what you are. Yep. All right. Let's see. Next question. Um, how effective did you find the integration of Western folklore into the Eastern storytelling of the show? I'm always interested in seeing those kind of mm -hmm. clashes, and you see that a lot in, um, it's actually why with, uh, I tried writing a review of X a while back. Mm -hmm. And I had the same problem. That's a totally different kind of series, yeah. but it's the same problem because X is four Japanese women trying to use Eastern uh, spirituality and symbolism to do the Book of Revelation. That's that's what that series is, and it's mm -hmm. that same kind of thing. It's like okay, this is very much a there there. You have the superficial European things, like the names of the characters and all that, but you also have, this is a very typical European style of fairy tale, how they're doing this. Even ballet is not a not a Japanese thing at all. Um, traditionally, I should say. There's Japanese ballet. <laughs> that was not to say there aren't Japanese ballet. If you are Japanese and you practice ballet, I respect you very much. <laughs> If you are anyone you practice ballet, I respect you very much because you're better. Because good God, you're amazing. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. But but the um, the way that it was used in the series, it, it, having the magical girl thing is such a distinctly Japanese way of doing the superhero, though. Mm -hmm. And that is, I, I'd say, is the most overtly Japanese thing about it. It's not the way, it's not, not even so much the way the characters are drawn, not, you know, the fact that it is anime. It's the fact that they use the magical girl, because that is, that is, to me, one of the most distinctly Japanese superheroes. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, your common Rider and Magical Girl are, for me, w the distinction between Japanese superheroes and American superheroes, because uh, I, I'm not going to go into common Rider. This isn't mm -hmm. the thing for that. But... For Japanese superheroes in the form of magical girls, here when you have a female superhero, she's dressed like a male superhero, she acts like a male superhero, maybe she shows more skin, but you know, acts like a male superhero. Japanese female superheroes, magical girls, are armored in femininity. You know, frills, frills and skirts and all of that are their armor. They they don't necessarily need to do a traditionally masculine thing because that's where their strength comes from. I don't know if this could would come out of a European or American story writer that you have this fairy tale setting that goes to such a dark place and it's resolved through dancing. Yep. I don't think that you'd get that. No, not at all. All right. Um, our next question is, what sets it apart from other shoujo anime? I think you, you actually brought them, one of them off, that the girl doesn't get the guy in the right? end. <laughs> he went off with that tr crow chick. Uh, I I think the, the not going for a decidedly not modern setting also helped out a okay. lot. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there are some of the traditional the things that you see in shoujo all the time. The klutzy main character, mm -hmm. the... Um, you know, the, the every girl who gets treated like a wallflower, that sort of thing. But, um, the, the, the fact that they decided not to go with a modern setting, this more fantasy mm -hmm. European countryside thing, the, the ballet motif, that just sets it apart from anime in general. You mm -hmm. don't see that kind of stagey thing. Mm -hmm. That's, I, I guess that's really... Simple as that. Right. I don't really have too much to say there. <laughs> All right. Um, the next question is, 
One of the more notable things about the show is the subversion of conventional fairy tale character journeys. Mm. Can you speak more on that? We touched, a, you know, we touched a little on more on fate and free will and how they affect the characters. But what do you think overall? Um, I, um, so many of those things you see with uh, again, my buddy fuck here, just mm -hmm. not in any other. Well, in any other story, in fact, in the story Drosselmeyer describes. Boring ass Muto would be the main character. Um, <laughs> actually, you even get that in. Conveniently, mm -hmm. I didn't do this as preparation for this show. I just did some heavy reading because I felt like it. Mm -hmm. I read Edith Hamilton mythology, oh, and nice. in in Jason and the Argonauts, you actually almost literally get this situation mm -hmm. um, of the Muto-Duck relationship almost, is that you have Jason, who is in theory your main character, mm -hmm. and he is described as the main character and heralded as the main character as such, but Jason meets the character of Medea, mm -hmm. um, the sorceress, and she does more. She tells Jason how to do every heroic thing he does. He doesn't come up with crap on his own. Medea does literally everything, mm -hmm. but it's Jason and the Argonauts. That's just how we know the story. And yeah, in any other story, this would have been uh, uh, Muto Fakir buddy cops. <laughs> eh. <laughs> I may have to commission that to be a drawing. Somebody's got to make it happen. Someone, someone, if oh, you give. Man. I will, I will cut you guys a deal. If someone draws me Muto, fuck your buddy cops. I want that poster. But that's what you'd get in any other story. Like, yeah. even if Duck did literally everything she does in the story, mm -hmm. in most fairy tales, Muto would have been the main character. <laughs> um, is that sexist? Yes. Um, I'm, that's not even a debate. Okay. But yeah, I don't know. That's Muto, fuck your buddy cops. That's, that's, that is what we almost had, and I'm glad we didn't have <laughs> Um. Yeah. All right. Well, the final question I have is, uh, what other anime or manga uses similar techniques that you would recommend to people who like Princess Tutu? So somebody watches Princess Tutu, I want more of whatever this all is. What you know, I things? don't know. I am really not sure on that one. Do you think one. it's Princess Tutu? Is that unique where... I really, I think, I, I can't think of anything else like it. Like the state, like I mean, some of the like the themes of subverting fate and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. You you get a lot of that in Clamp series. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like if you just want magical girls with the theme of subverting or um, falling prey to fate, uh, Magic Knight Ray Earth comes immediately to mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that still doesn't. But that goes back to my other thing about warriors of love and justice who will kill you with their sword. <laughs> <laughs> They murder a lot of people in that show. They do, really. Uh, not as many as Sailor Mars does on a regular basis, but but yeah, the the the, the dance thing, every the the staging thing. This is such a unique series. I don't. I would. I'm not sure if I'm the right person to ask on that one. Maybe someone, some smart aleck in the comic section, <laughs> comment section right now is probably typing up a list and calling me a dumbass, right, <laughs> as we speak. I'm putting the words in your mouth. Um, I don't know, uh, Bleachfan10002. Mm -hmm, that's, that's accurate. That is probably who is commenting right now. Nartard0123. YouTube, oh, <laughs> YouTube commenter I just made up. <laughs> um, no, but no, so I really can't think of anything else. It's This is such a unique series. It's such a one-of-a-kind thing. It's so different from everything else, even on the list, because the other mm -hmm. the other series that were on the um, the voting ballot included um, uh, Utana, which is another very unique series, mm -hmm. but completely different. Yeah. Um, Madoka Magica, which again completely different. Mm -hmm. um, and then, oh bloody hell, what was the other one that was on? Oh yeah, yeah, it was Kill or Kill. That's technically a Magical Girl series. That's definitely completely effing different from whatever this was. <laughs> this was art. I do stand by that. I think the, the thing that really separates... If if I wanted to pick something that was anime as art, mm -hmm. this is a top runner for that. Mm -hmm. This is much more than... It is so much more than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. It's so much more than what this medium is is associated with. It's so much more than what any of the genres that it's playing with are associated with. 
and I do highly recommend it. Mm-hmm. I I think that it's I think people are going to be talking about it. It's an older series, but I'm I'm shocked by how big the cult following was. Mm-hmm. Everyone in the uh, all the great people out there in YouTube land uh, following the Tumblr, uh, following the Facebook page for Nick Izumi, I had tons of people asking me to look at this series and to analyze it, to talk about it. And I'm really, I'd like to thank all of you who voted for this show because it really, it is a treasure. It is legitimately a treasure. Um, if, again, for some reason you listen to this and you haven't watched the series yet, and you're thinking, I would like to look at it. Um, it's on Hulu mm-hmm. with the uh, English dub that uh, both Jillian and I actually really liked. Yeah, I think the English dub is fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's really... I loved uh, Duck especially. It nails. She's so funny in the early She's episodes. So um, One of the best things I've seen is there's a YouTube clip of Lucy Christensen who plays... Who voices Duck... And they're record they're videotaping her while she's recording and those really strong emotional moments, like they show her the scene beforehand and she's in tears because it's it just moves her so much and they have a record and she's bawling. It came through doing these scenes. No, it, it really came through. Like she cared a lot about that yes. part. You can hear it in every line read that she gets. Oh yes. Um in the early episodes, I'll admit, I think she was better as duck than she was as Tutu, mm-hmm. but as the series went on, yeah, Lucy Christensen. Uh, uh, so great. Chris Patton um, was really, was, Chris Patton, I have never heard him in something where he didn't do really well. He's mm-hmm. just reliable. Yep. But yeah, he was a very good pick for fuck here. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of other really funny, uh, really funny reads, really strong reads. Drosselmeyer was delightful. Uh. So good. I love the character. Mr. Now. Cat was hilarious. That's how a cat would sound like if it was a human. That's exactly how a cat would sound like. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, the English dub, not terrible. Not I terrible do, at all. I do recommend. So, yeah. Um, I don't know. Is there anything else you'd like to plug before we get going? Um, I, I don't think so. I think every, everything everything's good. Well, check out GS Forces cosplay page um, on Facebook. She's fantastic. <laughs> Jillian, thank you for coming on and interviewing me about this awesome little series. Thank you for letting me ask you questions about Princess Tutu. It's probably my favorite anime series. <laughs> I'm hearing that from a lot of people, and I see why now. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening. And to all of you out there in the Izumi Nation, keep on spocking in the free world. Nailed it! Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted. It's fine. I, I, I'm going to sit yes, down and edit it. Yeah.